I did want to welcome to the stage one of my good friends, a great friend and supporter of Momentum, Annie Morita. She is the reason that we have Bonnie Wan and so many other amazing speakers. And Annie is caffeine personified. So to offset the grounding that we've done, we're going to get a little hyped here. So please welcome Annie Morita. I, I'm actually going to steal that. I'm your shot of espresso on a powder day. So perfect, perfect. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Annie Morita, friend of Kristen Fox, known as K Fox. So if you're not part of that, you need to join. We have stickers there in the lobby. Um, so you know that woman that you look at and you think, damn, she is crushing it. I'm so inspired by her. Please remember that you are that woman for someone else. Keep showing up because she needs you. Women need other women in their lives who think they are a big deal. No competition, no backhanded compliments, no comments, no jealousy, just I love you and I support you and there is no one on the earth like you. That kind of energy. So that kind of energy does not just happen. It's part of what matters most. And what matters most is achievable if you have a practice, a life practice. Some may say a life brief. After her phenomenal keynote at last year's Momentum Leadership Summit, the demand to put this practice into action and to have a guide in doing so was sky high. People loved the idea of the story and wanted to create a life brief for their own. The book has been written to provide this as a guide, but since it's not out until January, today we get to do this all together in community. Tried and tested by Bonnie herself, as well as thousands of attendees and workshops and lectures, the Life Brief Method is a powerful tool for solving life's biggest messes and creating a life of meaning. Adam Grant, Malcolm Gladwell, Dan Pink, Susan Kane. Yesterday, they announced that the Life Brief, a playbook for no regrets living by Bonnie Wan, is on the next Big Ideas must-read list for 2024. Yeah. For most of you who were here last year, we knew this in 2023, so obviously we're ahead of it. So without further ado, please welcome back to the Cowboy State and back to our stage for Momentum, the unstoppable Bonnie Wan. <clears throat> Thank you so much. The beauty of coming back is that it feels like coming home. And I see so many faces and names from last year. I also see some new ones. So I want to take a moment before we start to thank Kristen, Sam, and Annie for bringing me back here. I will take any excuse to be in Jackson, Wyoming. I want to thank Liz and Lindsay for setting the tone. That was really powerful. And whatever you felt in that meditation, that's your home base for today. And I want to thank Ruth for a powerful, potent, inspiring opening last night. And for those of you who might have missed it in person, I really invite you to go back to the video. Because the themes for today are getting real, unhiding and getting messy. And that's what I'm here to do, is to invite you into the mess. Because inside the mess is where the juice lies. Ruth invited us to tune into curiosity. That's how we bridge our differences and build connection. Today, I invite you to be curious about yourself. Bring that curiosity, yes, on your neighbors, new friends, this beautiful community we call Jackson, Wyoming, which is so strong. But I want you to tune that curiosity into yourself. That is one of the invitations for today. And I want to thank you. And I want you to thank yourself, because you've done 90% of the work already. You showed up. 
you showed up, you got up early, you bared the cold. You do that all the time, I know that. Um, it's special for me. <laughs> and you came here. You carved out a whole day to gift yourself the space, the spaciousness to do the work, to get curious about your own life. And I am not up here to be the perfect and polished one who has all the answers. I'm here to be in the mess with you. Because right now, as I look at the headlines in the world, as I look at the communities around me, my loved ones, my friends, my family, this is a season of transition. And I don't know if you're feeling it, but I'm feeling it in my bones. And we have all been called to do this work. Because when we do this work, as Ruth said, we connect, we bridge our differences, and we find the freedom to model who we want to be in the world. And we invite others to show up in the same ways all around us because our actions speak. So here we go. We're gonna turn that lens of curiosity on ourselves, starting with this question. What do you want? Did something come up for you? If so, I want you to write it down. You were all gifted pens and notebooks for a reason. Okay, whatever came up, I want you to put it out on the page. Now, I'm not asking you, what do you feel like? What do you think you want? What do your parents want for you? What does your boss expect? What does your partner want? Or what do your kids need? I'm not asking any of those questions. What I'm asking is, in your heart of hearts, what do you really, really want? And maybe that you haven't allowed yourself to admit yet. And if something comes up for you in this moment, I want it to come out and onto the page. And if you just did that, then you're already in. You are already doing the life brief practice because if you walk away from anything today, with anything today, it is this thing that we just did together is always available to you. And this is the heart of the practice right here, allowing whatever comes up to come out onto the page without judgment, without editing, without withholding. So we are all life briefing already. Curiosity starts with questions. Sometimes those questions come from ourselves, sometimes from someone like me, and other times out of the blue out of nowhere. Today, Lindsay, Liz, and I are gonna share lots of stories. Ruth shared hers, many of hers, last night. But I want you to know, even though your circumstances are different, there are universal truths in the stories you're gonna hear. And even though this story and some others are mine, today is all about you. The power of story is that when we listen to someone else's story, things come up for our, ourselves. And again, what's the practice? <laughs> when something comes up, it's gonna come out and onto the page. And once it's parked, you can let go and be in the next moment, right? That's how we're gonna travel together today. I think it was 2016 the question 
the driving, the penetrating question did not come from me. It came from my husband. In the middle of a unmemorable, typical argument of marriage. I can't even tell you. I can't remember what sparked the fight. But I can remember the question he asked, which completely startled me. Are you still madly in love with me? What? <laughs> An answer came up. It did not dare come out of my mouth. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? But I'm very good on my feet. I deflected. That's what I do. I do this in the boardroom all the time, right? When a hard question comes, I know how to lob it back. Mad love? What, what are you talking about? What is that even? I mean, is that puppy love? Is that, I mean, is, is that teenager speak? I, what do you even mean? You know, so I threw, I met his question with a series of questions. But I knew the answer. It was right here. And it was right here, and it came so close to coming out. But I diverted. We had just moved back to San Francisco after a six, six golden years in Portland, Oregon, where our, my, our first life brief, my very first life brief, took us in a moment of need, took us out of the dark chapter of our relationship and our young family, and brought us to Portland, Oregon, where we opened our golden chapter. And those of you who were here last year, you remember that story. But after things evolved, life briefs evolve, our lives evolve, we added Mabel, my fourth, our fourth, to our nest of four kids and our family of six. And I got promoted. I was made a partner and the head of brand strategy at my storied agency in San Francisco. And the deal was, it's time to come home, Bonnie. We let you work remote for these last six years, but we're gonna promote you, but it's time to come home. This experiment is done. We need you back in the office. And I said, okay. But my family, this was not their brief. This was my brief. And I was uprooting my family out of something they loved, a community they'd grown to be participants in. Oh, we're moving because mommy is moving for her work. That was my children's story. My husband was deeply reluctant, but feared my reaction if he spoke his truth. And that was the beginning of a new form of dividing separation between us. And by the time he asked this question, we'd already moved back, a really hard transition. We were living separate lives. Instead of this wonderful blended life I had created in Portland, Oregon, where I worked a four-day week, my commute was up the stairs to our house, I could walk my kids to school, the grocery store was the other block away, everything was within a one block radius of our lives. But now we're back in the car in California. Instead of being at work, at work two days a week, I was at work five days a week. And in long commutes back to the office, and they're very late and coming home, and suddenly, we were living these separate lives. My husband, it was like, if anyone's watched Mad Men, that was my life, except I was Don Draper, <laughs> minus the affairs. <laughs> but, you know, my husband would hand me a cup of coffee as I ran out already on the phone in a meeting, taking, you know, Ruby, our third, because uh, I drop her off at school and then on my way to San Francisco. We are most vulnerable in moments of transition. And while we, were, we knew it, we didn't speak it. We hid, as Ruth 
has so poignantly told us. The universal truth is that we are all hiding something. And in this moment, I was hiding my dissatisfaction, a bitterness for being the sole breadwinner, a fascination with other people I was spending time with. I had just come home from a big talk in Detroit. I nailed it. So I took myself out to dinner to celebrate at my favorite restaurant, Middle Eastern restaurant in Birmingham, Michigan. And I saddled up to the bar and ordered my favorite meal, malfouf, which is stuffed cabbage. And a lovely man next to me struck up a conversation. And I was feeling good, I was open. We talked and after my meal, we talked for two more hours, I met his best friends, and then came the end of the night. I had an early flight home to San Francisco, and he said, where are you going? Don't leave yet. Uh, I was like, what? Well, I have to go home. I, ha I have an early flight. I have to get to bed. He said, no, why don't you stay? I have tickets to the opera. Stay another night, and we'll go to the opera together. And I thought, what? Oh. And something burst out inside me. And I thought, yeah, I want to stay. I want to go to the opera. I want to have more time with this lovely man. I said no. The responsible side of me kicked in. I called my, whatever, Lyft, Uber, I can't remember. Maybe a taxi, I don't remember. Um, and I got in, and the driver said, hi, how are you tonight? And I burst out crying. I sobbed hysterically, and he didn't know what to do. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just picked up this crazy lady, <laughs> this very emotional crazy lady. And he said, um, tissue? And he handed me a box of tissues. And I didn't want to leave the restaurant. I didn't want to leave the feeling. I did not want to leave Detroit. I wanted to go to the opera. But I came home to my family, and then my husband asked me that question. No, I'm not madly in love with you. But as, as what happens in a family of six, you don't have many moments to think or sit. I, ha I was packing, I was going to Boston. I flew to Boston early the next day, three days in Boston pitching one of the biggest accounts, new business pitch, I lost myself in the work, as many of us do. It's a wonderful distraction from the unbearable questions. I pitched my heart out. We won the pitch. I got off, out of the hotel, suitcase packed, back on the plane. And something happens when the deadlines are gone. And you're up in the air, or in a car, or in the shower. The questions find you because I call them gripping questions because they emerge out of nowhere. There it was again. Am I madly in love? Well, I knew the question was no. But the real question is, do I want to be madly in love? So I had to break this down into a few more questions. First, do I want mad love? Hell yes, that came up like a visceral, primal animal. <laughs> I am too young to never experience the fire of desire to be the, to, to feel my own mad love, much less be the object of somebody else's mad love. That I couldn't imagine it felt worse than death in that moment. Still does, right here, 
when I think about that possibility. Hell yes, I want mad love. Yes, I want mad love. I didn't write it down, but you know. But then I had to think about the harder question. Do I want mad love with Chip, my husband of 17 years? My husband, father of my four kids. My husband who I have traversed many chapters of life already with? That was the harder question. And as I let it sink in, I asked another series of questions. Who am I when I'm with him? Who am I when I'm not with him? Am I frustrated because I've come to the end of growing, of becoming with him? Or am I frustrated for other reasons? And when I really thought deeply about it, I thought, oh, I'm better when I'm with him. I like myself more when I'm with him. It's hard being with him. But part of that hard is because he challenges me in the ways that I need to be challenged. I'm softer when I'm with him. I feel safe when I'm with him. Not in the physical, I need a man safe, but I feel safe to be my ugliest self, my messiest self, my most visceral self, I'm not judged by him. He's imminently patient, and he has been from day one. And I remember sitting at a bar, keeping him waiting for an hour. This was pre-cell phone time. But I knew he was waiting. This is when we were dating. And I strolled up to the bar an hour late, and I was sassy and confident. And I just acted natural. Hey, how you doing? I had kept him waiting for an hour. And he just really calmly, and this is how my husband acts, he said, hey, wow, hi. I just need you to know something before we start tonight. I'm not afraid to be alone. What? My coy, flirty self, you know. He said, I, I'm just not afraid to be alone. So if you don't want to be here with me, that's OK. We can just leave this bar right now. But I'm not really here to play games. And in that moment, I knew. He is the strongest man I have ever met. And when he asked me that question, that was his strength coming out again, asking for truth in our relationship. So this is where curiosity begins. Either you're going to ask the question, I'm going to ask the question, or somebody else is going to ask the question. But let's not hide from the question. And that's what we're going to do today. What the heck is a life brief? In easy terms, in my industry, in advertising, a life brief is a creative brief for your life. What the hell is that, for those of you who have never seen a creative brief? It is a sharp distillation of what's essential, what matters most, expressed in a way that puts a fire in your belly, makes you want to act now, generates ideas and possibility, and gets you to think way outside of the box. And that's what I do as a career strategist for over 30 years. I have been making meaning out of messiness for some of the biggest companies and brands in the world. 
brands who are in categories or industries that are being wildly disrupted by technology and much faster, more flexible companies. Brands who have existed for a hundred years but don't know who they should be tomorrow. My job is to cut through the confusion, the complexity, and help them arrive at what is their truth, their ownable magic, so that they can ideate and act from that place of clarity. And we're gonna talk about why clarity is so dang important. And I do this at this wonderful ad agency that has been my home for the last 25 years, Goodby Silverstein and Partners. Um, and now, through the life brief, I get to do this with people. So I like to say I'm a brand strategist that's become a life strategist. And what you have shown up to today, whether you're online or in this beautiful auditorium, is you've created the space to explore your questions and to find your own clarity. And you're gonna find your own creativity and courage while doing it. Ruth was so courageous up here, telling us about her journey from hiding to unhiding. And now we get to use that inspiration today, and we'll have Ruth come up and talk more about it later this afternoon. But we are in community, and we're gonna get clear together. Because clarity is, for many people, a courageous act. And we're gonna play just, you know, Lindsay, Liz, Ruth and I are here to support you in that, and we're gonna get messy too, and we're gonna get courageous together. We're gonna to step in the sandbox. Because here's what I have learned in the 14 years that I have life briefed. So many times the cultural conversation is, women, can they have it all? Do we want it all? I don't think so. Um, no, I found you cannot have it all but you can have all that matters if you are clear about what matters to you and only you, first you. Now that's a dangerous and for forbidden thought, especially from the culture that I have been raised. In Asia, in China, you do not think about yourself first. It's always the collective first. Marion and I talked about that last night. It's society first, family next, you dead last. But Ruth talked about the power of being self-centered. And that's what this practice is, being centered in yourself. Because when we are centered and unhiding, we are free and we get to connect, build community, and model for our children, model for our neighbors, model for our coworkers, the beauty of being self-centered. Because when you get clear about what matters, you can get creative about living the life you want. And here's what matters about that. Usually we are raised and conditioned to believe there are only two answers to any question. Yes or no. Stay or leave. Either or. This or that. But really, the life is full of creative possibilities. So many more ways to off-road, create paths, carve new ones that are uniquely suited to you. So do not buy into this idea that there are only two answers to whatever question is sitting with you in your heart right now. And we're going to play with all those possibilities and start to step into the expansiveness of creative thinking. Somebody asked a really great question last night to Ruth. They said, um, what industries are better for unhiding 
than others. And she said, well, let me get back to you. I want to do the research because Ruth is badass and researches everything before she gives answers, which I applaud. But then she said, I suspect maybe creative industries because creative industries are always asking people to think out of the box. And that is the beauty of where I come from. I've spent the last 30 years in creative sandboxes with creative misfits, people who don't take no for an answer, people who hear the word impossible and they hear fighting words. I'm gonna prove you wrong. And so we're gonna practice and try this on because you have more than two answers available to you at this time. And this is a practice not a plan. As David White says, and I'm not gonna quote him exactly because I have menopause brain, but <laughs> your plans are too small for you to live. I know we're a room of overachievers, planners, we have plan A, we have plan B, we have all the way to plan G probably, right? But this is a practice, and you started it right when I said, what do you want? the practice of it coming up and out onto the page. This is not a plan, because plans are built, and I am a fan of financial planning, right? If you're gonna produce something, you need to plan. But what I'm talking about, the plan of, or the practice of unhiding, the practice of getting comfortable with your truth, letting it come out without editing, without judgment, that is a practice. And why it's a practice is it gets easier the more you do it. Unhiding is easier when you do it in small, tiny ways. But every day. So that's what we're gonna do together today. And there are three parts to this practice. Getting messy, getting clear, then getting active. And most people skip getting messy. We're not gonna skip it today. That's where the juicy stuff is. Because you can't get clear unless you've looked at your ingredients. What are you gonna get clear about? And if you act without clarity, what happens? We're just kinda doing stuff, right? And so the fun part is that action is easy. It's the byproduct of clarity. So today we're gonna get messy together. And what does a life brief look like? It's five, up to five. You can do three, you can do one, you can do two, you know. But no more than five because briefs are brief. They're meant to be concise, sharp, and sticky. They're gonna be five bold declarations and we'll talk about what that is, but let's not worry about it at the moment. And then summed up with one sharp and sticky name. So this was the brief I wrote on that plane on my way home from Boston. I am ready to fall madly in love with my husband again. Did I believe that that was possible? No. Hell no. But I wrote it anyways because the driving question is not can I get it? The driving question is, do I want it? And yes, my answer on the plane was yes, I want it. I am ready to be co-creators and collaborators in life. I love it when we are gelling and stirring and being each other's clay. I'm ready to encourage, support, and celebrate each other. I am ready to stop nitpicking him, critiquing him competing with him. Yep, that was happening too. I am ready to give our full presence and loving guidance to our kids. That was hard. It was easy for my ego to get caught up in the winds at work. And that fed me and fueled me in a way that sometimes I didn't want to go back to the meltdowns and the chaos and the dishes and the laundry. And I am ready to attract all that we need as a family to thrive. That was my brief, summed up in a sharp, sticky name, Mad Love. So I didn't have to remember all five of those declarations. I just needed to remember Mad Love. 
because that evoked everything the rest of the brief stood for. And it was right here and right here and right here, always. So that's what we're going to do together today. We're going to write your gut brief. And here's what I tell my strategists at the agency. What you put into the brief determines what you get out of the brief. We don't have time, but this is not a practice about time. You might say, oh my, I'm not going to get very far today. We're only going to do one day. She usually teaches these 10-day retreats. Yes, you can have the luxury of 10 days, but it's not a matter of time. It is a matter of your presence and your attention. That's what makes for a great brief. And so what Liz and Lindsay did for us and what they're going to do for us again and continued throughout the day is stir up your attention and focus it and bring it right back into your body, right back into the now, and take it out of the fear, the anxiety, the worries, the memories, or the future. And we're going to keep coming back here. And with that attention and presence, you're going to write a kick-ass brief. And kick-ass means a brief that speaks to you, unfiltered you unapologetic you. And over the time I have, the last 14 years, I have written briefs for every single part of my life. I have a health brief, I have a wealth brief, I have a work brief, I have a parenting brief, which saved my son. I believe it saved his life, and it saved us as a family. And of course, I have a marriage brief, I have lots of briefs. And these are all the, some of the sticky, sharp handles. We can go come back and talk about them, but I don't want them to be too much. Today we're going to write your gut brief, so you're, gonna, you're not going to write it from here. You're going to push your attention here, maybe here, if you dare. Because we are women. We are anchored in creation. Life is a creative act. So you know how to do this. We just need to practice it, OK? And here are the enemies that get in the way. And if they are coming up for you right now, I want you to tell them, pet them, acknowledge them, and then ask them to go in the corner. Go sit in the corner. We can stack them all right here. Skeptical? much? Cynical much? Perfectionist. Am I doing this right, Bonnie? Because I don't want to write anything until I'm doing it right. I don't want to do it wrong, OK? Nope. You can sit over here. Thank you very much. Um, limiting stories. Oh, no. You know, I have, uh, I met someone in my first retreat. First day, she said, my parents told me, never ask what I want that will only set me up for disappointment. OK. OK. Well, you can sit right over here. That Your parents can sit right over here in the corner, OK? I know you all have them. Please park them right here for now, OK? You can welcome them back into your hearts, minds, wherever they go at 5 o'clock. All right? Here we go. There's no ready. Yeah? We're going to do this, and we're going to get messy, OK? 